Planes flying high is a good thing, isn't it? That's what they're designed for, to fly high, right? But when does it become a problem? What are the dangers that can prevail from excessively high flight? Tune in and we'll let you know about everything you need to know about high-level flight. Hello and welcome to our very first video. If it's your first time here and you want to learn about flying, aircraft and all things aviation, start now by subscribing and clicking the bell icon so you don't miss a thing. In today's video, we're talking jet planes flying high and why is it the problem? This is Project Altitude. Let's get straight into it. Most commercial flights have a cruising altitude between 30 and 40,000 feet. This is usually the sweet spot that flight operators target to get the most bang for their buck. The general rule is, the higher up you go into the atmosphere, the thinner the air becomes, and the thinner the air becomes, the faster the plane flies. This is due to the decrease in air resistance or drag, which all in all creates a perfect scenario for a more fuel efficient flight, as the engines don't have to work as hard for the same output they would achieve at lower altitudes. Smaller business jets can achieve cruise altitudes of over 50,000 feet due to their lower body to engine size ratios. Concorde, an exception in the commercial jet category, managed sustained crews at 60,000 feet due to its supersonic nature. Beyond this, the SR-71 Blackbird, a US Air Force reconnaissance aircraft from the 60s, was able to get up to dizzying heights of around 90,000 feet. That's the same as 33 Burj Khalifa towers stacked on top of each other. Newer, more advanced aircraft have achieved higher heights even beyond this. Moreover, these high altitude flights allow pilots to evade most undesirable weather phenomena like thunderstorms, hail and turbulence, given for a more comfortable and smoother ride for the passengers in the back. This way everyone's happy. This same logic applies to the avoidance of bird strikes too. Believe it or not, planes can actually fly higher than their cruising altitudes if the pilot chooses to do so. This could be for a multitude of reasons. One example here is there could be a jet stream at a higher altitude that the pilots want to take advantage of to reduce overall flight time and fuel burn. The key factor limiting how high planes can fly are the aerodynamic ceilings. For simplicity's sake, we are only talking with regard to service and absolute ceilings in this video. If you want to learn more in depth about aerodynamic ceilings, let us know in the comments section below. You may be wondering why not just fly on the ceiling limits? Surely the air resistance is even less at these altitudes and the airlines would save themselves even more on fuel costs. The simple answer is they won't save on fuel cost. It's quite the opposite actually. The general idea of the higher you fly, the more efficient the flight is still holds true, but to a certain limit. Eventually, there comes a point where the air is so thin that the engines cannot produce any real thrust even when set to full power. It's a similar principle to a human being climbing a mountain. The higher the person climbs, the harder it becomes for them to breathe. At the top of the mountain, they would only intake a fraction of oxygen that they would at the bottom of the said mountain. Aircraft engines need enough oxygen to mix with fuel to burn and to produce sufficient thrust. With little to no thrust and the air density this low, the aerodynamic forces required to keep planes airborne become extremely weak and ineffective, eventually leading to stalls and other undesirable aircraft states. Apart from performance issues, airlines typically don't operate their commercial flights right on ceiling limits for safety concerns. One such example is a rapid decompression. In the event of this emergency, the pilots need to be able to get the plane down to a safe altitude as quickly and safely as possible. The great danger of depressurization is flight crew incapacitation due to a severe lack of oxygen and now factors like time of useful consciousness start to become a serious concern. 
Time of Useful Consciousness, or TUC, is something to get into at a later date. But for now, know that at 35,000 feet, if there is a rapid decompression, you have about 30 to 60 seconds before you're unable to act logically due to a lack of oxygen. Increase that altitude to 50,000 feet and now you have less than 10 seconds before it all kicks in. This is why those pre-flight safety videos tell you to put on your own oxygen mask before helping others to put on theirs. Also, now you know a little more about what goes into flight planning and why planes fly at the altitudes they do. Is there something we missed? Have you ever experienced decompression during a flight? Don't forget to like this video and let us know your thoughts and experiences in the comments below. Thanks for watching and soar high aviators!